So we're going to be continuing with chapter seven. This is part B. Uh, please be sure that you've uh, viewed part A before you start into this part. Uh, if you, in case you need the material that, uh, you need to review the material that's covered in that section, uh, which is primarily the skull. Um, you can find a link in the, in the comments below. Uh, and as always, if you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me, send me a message uh, through YouTube. Uh, or, uh, again, leave it in the comments below, below, and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we're going to be looking now at the vertebral column uh, in this section, mostly. Um, so now, uh, some people, uh, they think that your vertebral column or the spinal cord, it's not flexible. They think it's like, it's, it's very rigid. That's not the case. Uh, it's actually quite flexible. Uh, and because it's less flexible, you know, you're allowed to bend, uh, for example, to touch your knees or your toes. Uh, you know, you can uh, bend sideways. Uh, you can stretch backwards. Uh, it's this flexibility that provides that. Um, so now this vertebral column, it's also referred to as your spinal column or, or the spine. And it's made up of, uh, of 26 bones. And these are irregular uh, bones. Um, so... As far as this uh, functions go, what is what is it there for? Well, it serves as the axial support of your trunk. Uh, the spine, it extends from your skull all the way down to your pelvis. Uh, now, it's at the pelvis where it transmits the weight of your trunk to your lower limbs. Uh, it also surrounds and protects your spinal cord. And uh, 360 degrees, this is the main, uh, and next to the brain, this is the, the next part of your, uh, your your spinal cord and brain. Remember, this, this is a central part of your nervous system. Without this, you cannot live very long. Uh, so, uh, these both the brain and the spinal cord they need to be very well protected. And and uh, the vertebral column it protects the spinal cord very well. Um, in addition to that, uh, in addition to providing support uh, for. Uh, uh, protecting the spinal cord, the backbones, your vertebrae, they also serve as attachment points for your costals uh, to anchor into. So your, your, your ribs, again, that's the term for, uh, the, the correct term for ribs are costals. This is where they come and they attach to. Uh, also, the, the muscles of your back and uh, some of the muscles of your neck, they also attach to uh, your vertebral column. Um, now, uh, there's five regions that uh, of the uh, of these 26 bones, they get divided into five regions, which we're going to be looking at next. Uh, so your um, your vertebral column, uh, it's roughly 28 inches long, uh, and it gets uh, again, like I said, it gets broken up into five uh, major regions. Now, before we start looking at these regions, uh, something that I wanted to mention to you is that uh, when you're looking at uh, a fetus. There's actually 33 bones that make up uh, uh, 33 vertebrae okay? that make up uh, the, the the spinal cord or the vertebral column. Uh, I'm not the spinal column, sorry, the, the vertebral column or the spinal column uh, for the fetus. However, what, what ends up happening is the bones that make up your cossex and the the sacrum they end up fusing together. So then you end up getting 24. You know, you end up getting the uh, uh, once those all those bones fuse, so uh, the, the bones that make up the sacrum, they fuse uh, into one bone, and then the bone that make up the cossex, they end up fusing into one bone. So in total, this is how we end up with this 26 bones uh, that we find in the adult, in in, uh, in individuals. Uh, so now let's look at the regions. So uh, your cervical region, this is essentially your neck, all right, and it's made up of seven uh, vertebrae. All right, cervical regions makes up uh, uh, your neck. There's seven vertebrae here. Uh, the first one is called the axis, C1, and uh, C2 is called the axis. So when we name these vertebrae uh, according to the regions, again, we use the first letter C, which signifies uh, cervical, and then because there's seven bones, we say, okay, this is the first cervical bone, so C1. The second cer cervical bone is going to be C2. Same thing for the thoracic. Uh, the first thoracic bone is called T1. The fifth would be called T5. It's the same goes for lumbar, L1 through L5, T1 through T12, uh, the sacral bone, C1 through C7. Uh, so uh, the bones in the cervix uh, in the, that, that make up the, the cervical region, uh, they look very different from the bones that make up the thoracic region. All right, The bones that we find in the thoracic region, they look very different from the ones that we find in the lumbar region. 
the bones of, in the lumbar, they look different from the ones in the sacrum, and the ones in the sacrum look different from the cossacks. So all these bones, okay, in these regions, they look very different. And a lot of it has to do because of their function. Their function dictates its shape. Okay, we talked about this earlier, very earlier on, uh, all the way down to protein. And this uh, carries through in, you know, in, in gross anatomy as well. Um, so uh, a good way to remember this is, you know, think about your meal time, 7, 12, and 5. So, you know, 7 a.m. you have breakfast, 12 o'clock lunch, and then 5 o'clock, um, you know, you have your supper or your dinner. Uh, so uh, remember, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar. Uh, so sacrum, this is one bone that's fused together, all right? And it articulates uh, laterally with your hip bones. And then your cossacks, these are also few, fused bones, uh, and it forms uh, the, the end of your, uh, your, your uh, vertebral column. What we have here is, again, we see bones that are small here, and as they start to go down, they start to get larger. And then, again, uh, what ends up happening by the time you get back to the cossacks is the bones get small. So you go from small bones to large bones back to small bones. Uh, so when you look at the, the, uh, your, your vertebral column from the side, you see that you know, it, it has a, a lot of uh, uh, turns over there or a lot of, lots of curvatures. So there's four main curvatures. And this helps increase its resiliency and also the flexibility of, of, uh, of the spine. So uh, at the cervical and lumbar curvatures, you, end, you see this concave, uh, th that it's a curved concave posteriorly. And then when you come to the thoracic and the sacral, uh, sacral curvatures, you tend to see it being convex posteriorly. So when you look over here, again, this is C1, this is C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. These are the seven, uh, your uh, uh, cervical vertebrae. And notice how it is. It's starting to uh, look at this. Also look at the, first of all, let's just go th through these first. So then after your uh, seven cervical uh, vertebrae, you have your thoracic vertebrae. And remember, what did, what did we say? We have 12 of these thoracic vertebrae. Uh, so. Uh, here we go, T1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So these are the 12 thoracic vertebrae. After that, you have your uh, lumbar vertebrae, and you have five lumbar vertebrae here. So there's L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Then you have your five uh, sacral uh, bones over here that are fused together to form a sacrum. And then you have your cossacks, your uh, costal bones over here. There, there's four bones that are fused together. Now, one thing I want to mention, we all have the same number of uh, cervical verte vertebrae, you know, seven. Uh, in roughly, in probably less than 5% of the people, there, there could be a variation. Uh, they may have less of some of these other bones. Uh, now, primarily, what we're starting to see now is that a lot of people, they, don't, they no longer have this cossex bones, or the amount of bones over here uh, is starting to diminish. Uh, so uh, some people, you know, are you know, they're thinking that this mo bone will go away. You know, it, we might uh, it might be evolved away uh, from humans uh, because we're not really using this anymore. Uh, in other mammals, you know, this cossex is, is much longer and it ends up being a tail. Uh, so, yeah. Now, so if you look over here uh, at the cervical region and the uh, uh, the, the lumbar region, you're seeing that, you know, the curvature is concave, okay, posteriorly, you know, this is the posterior aspect, uh, it's, it's concave. Then when you look at the thoracic region, okay, uh, and the sacral region, you see that it's convex, again, po posteriorly, it's convex. Uh, so keep that in mind, so you end up having this S-shaped, uh, uh, that forms, uh, at, you know, uh, with the vertebral column. Uh, before we start talking about ligaments, let's just uh, recall what ligaments are. So ligaments, these are, t this is tissue that attaches uh, bone to bone, okay? So ligaments, they connect two or more bones together. Um, tendons, they attach muscles to bone, all right? So ligaments and tendons, we're going to be looking at these uh, as we move through. Uh, so now, when we're looking at the vertebral column, What's keeping these vertebral column in place? What helps them align, you know, within the uh, uh, amongst one another? Uh, what gives them the flexibility? Well, uh, ligaments they and the muscles they help support your vertebral column. Uh, 
So the major supporting ligaments are the anterior and posterior longitudinal, uh, longitudinal ligaments. Uh, these guys, they run as continuous bands down the front and, and uh, back surface of, the verte of, of your uh, uh, vertebral column. Uh, so they end up extending all the way from your neck all the way down to the sacrum. Now of these two ligaments, the anterior is, is, is much stronger than the posterior ligament, which is uh, it's relatively weak. Uh, the anterior uh, ligament, it prevents hyperextension and in addition to supporting, uh, playing a supporting role. Uh, the posterior, uh, posterior ligament, uh, it, it resists hyperflexion. Uh, so again, they, they kind of have uh, opposite uh, effects. One is for uh, the, the first one, uh, the anterior ligament for hyperextension, the, other, the, the, the posterior for um, hyperflexion, and it makes sense. The lig ligamentum flavum, uh, it connects the adjacent vertebrae. Uh, it contains elastic connective tissue, and uh, it's especially strong. Uh, it stretches as we bend forward, and then it recoils when we resume the erect position. Now, remember, keep in mind that uh, elastic connective tissue, uh, it has the ability to stretch a lot. So these are the properties of this type of tissue. Uh, it's a short ligament, and it connects each vertebrae to those that are directly above and below it. So in this picture here, uh, you can see uh, your intervertebral disc here. So these are the your, your uh, the vertebrae. Uh, these appear to be uh, uh, thoracic vertebrae. Um, and let's see what can we see here. So right off the bat, you, you can see your anterior longitudinal ligament that we talked about. And then uh, we said we also have these uh, posterior longitudinal ligament that we find over here. Okay. Now. Uh, this is the ligamentum, uh, ligamentum flavum. I remember uh, this is; these are connecting uh, the the bones that are directly above and directly below. Okay, and again, this side, the type of tissue here is very different than the type of tissue we have over here. Okay, the anterior and posterior uh, uh, longitudinal ligaments. Um, in addition to that, this is a it's a median section, uh, and we can clearly see uh, the the parts of the the intervertebral disc. Uh, now, this is the, the part that's called the nucleus pulpus, and this region here is called the annulus fibrosis, and we're going to be looking at these in detail. Uh, so as we, what else, can, maybe something else you can look at. So um, the, the, your thoracic vertebrae, they have these spinous processes uh, that uh, the cervical vertebrae do not have. Um, this is a supraspinous ligament that they, we were able to see over here. Uh, and yeah, this is the, the intervertebral foramen, right over there, intervertebral foramen. Uh, and let's uh, move forward. There we go. You can see again in this picture the anterior longitudinal ligament uh, very clearly. Notice it's a very broad, uh, it's a large, uh, uh, strong ligament over here. And comparatively, the posterior longitudinal ligament much smaller, so it's much weaker. This is the strong one, this is the, the, the weak one. Um, and uh, yes, you can see the, well, this is the body of the vertebrae, uh, the transverse processes, the vertebrae over here. Um, all right, so we'll come back to, we'll look at some other pictures as we move forward. So now we're gonna be looking at these intervertebral discs. So each intervertebral disc, it's a, it's a cushion-like pad that's made up of two parts. Now the inner, the inner part, it's, a gel it's gelatinous, and it's called the nucleus pulposus. This, uh, the nuclear pulposus, it acts like a rubber ball, and uh, it gives uh, the disc its uh, uh, elasticity and compressibility uh, properties. Now, surrounding the nucleus pulposus, uh, we have this strong collar that's made up of collagen fibers, superficially, and fiber cartilage internally. This is called the annulus fibrosis. Uh, and uh, the annulus fibrosis, it limits the expansion of the nucleus pulposus when the spine is compressed. So uh, it acts like a woven strap to bind the successive vertebrae together. This helps withstand the twisting forces, and it resists tensions in the spine. We find the, the, these intervertebral discs, as the name implies, uh, between uh, the bodies of the neighboring vertebrae. Uh, and they act as shock absorbers when you're walking, when you're jumping, and when you're running. And they also allow the, the spine to flex and extend, and to, to a smaller extent, to bend to the sides laterally. Uh, at points of compression, 
the discs, they flatten and they bulge out a, a little bit between the vertebrae. Now the di discs, they're thickest in the lumbar and the cervical regions. Uh, this enhances the flexibility of these regions. Uh, collectively, uh, these discs, they account for about 25% uh, of the height of the vertebral column. Uh, they flatten somewhat during the course of the day. Uh, so we're always a few millimeters shorter at night than when you are first thing in the morning. So now when you look at this picture here, uh, again, so this is a sup superior view of a herniated intervertebral disc. Uh, now here, you can see the spinous process. Again, this is also uh, appears to be a thoracic vertebrae. Uh, and you guys will be able to tell as we move forward. Uh, but uh, so over here, this is the annulus fibrosis. Okay, it's the outermost part. And then there goes your inner nucleus. Uh, pulposis over here. Uh, this is just spinal cord that you find over here. Uh, and uh, what else do you see? Yeah, these are the transverse process of the of the of the verte of the this vertebrae, and this is the 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 spinous process of the vertebrae over here. Uh, so again, when you look over here, this is the nucleus uh, pulposis of an intact disc that you're able to see in this uh, MRI image. Uh, and this is a herniated disc. Notice that it's displaced, okay? This is how it should be looking like, all right? But this one, it goes out and is now it's pushing down on, uh, this is your spinal cord, so it's pushing down on the spinal cord. Uh, and this is very painful condition. Uh, it could uh, impair movement also. Uh, you may not be able to move properly because of this. Uh, it, you know, it, uh, it's gonna affect your uh, range of mobility, of course. Uh, so, yeah, severe physical trauma to the spine, it could result in one or more herniated or a prolapsed disc, which we saw in the previous uh, slide of the MRA. Uh, now, this usually involves a rupture of this annulus fibrosis, and this results in the protrusion of that nucleus pulposus. And so when this happens, as we saw in the previous, uh, in that MRI, it can uh, push down, compress the spinal cord around the nerves. And again, this causes a lot of pain. It's going to limit your motion. Uh, to, to your range of motion, uh, it'll cause uh, numbness as well. Uh, so if, let's just go back over here. So if you look over here, now notice what it's doing. It's pushing down on these nerves and the spinal cord. Uh, of course, when you're in pain, you're not going to be able to move too much. Your, your range of motion is going to decrease. So what do you do? Well, uh, exercise, massage, uh, of course, uh, painkillers, heat. Uh, you know, th these things, they help also. There's also surgery. Again, a lot of times we'll have to have surgery uh, to end up uh, correcting the issue. So this involves bone grafting to fuse those adjoining vertebrae. Uh, the other thing now, again, uh, you can start doing uh, uh, alternative therapies as well. So if you go to a chiropractor through manipulation, uh, they seem to, to, to help significantly. Uh, a lot of these... Uh, you know, these issues that you have, especially with the spinal column, uh, in the, uh, with the cases like a herniated discs as well. In addition to that, uh, you know, if you, for those, you know, that don't want surgery, uh, there's another option that you can do. Uh, you can have your disc partially uh, zapped or vaporized uh, with a laser. Uh, this is done in an outpatient uh, setting. There's no anesthesia that's required. There's no general anesthesia that's required uh, for this procedure. Uh, and uh, so what they end up doing is they end up uh, uh, they end up burning away uh, part of uh, part of the disc uh, in, in a nutshell. So now you don't have compression of the, those nerves and spinal uh, or the spine uh, or whatever parts that's that's prolapsed. prolapsed. There's uh, any tears in the annulus; those could be sealed also electrothermally uh, at the same time. So, you know, usually at the end of the day, you know, the patients, they usually leave with a small Band-Aid, uh, you know. Uh, so, again, it's, it's, it's uh, quite painless. Uh, you know, there's virtually no downtime, uh, you know, comparatively, compared to surgery. And it's, uh, you know, it costs much less. Abnormal spinal curvatures, uh, they can be congenital or they can result from disease, uh, poor posture, or unequal pulling of muscles of, on the spine. Uh, three of the most common types uh, of these abnormal spinal curvatures are scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis. So the very first one, scoliosis, this is an abnormal lateral curvature, abnormal lateral rotation of your spine. Uh, most often this occurs in the thoracic region. And uh, one of the things that you end up having is uh, that uh, this individual, 
uh, they may have difficulty breathing if this occurs within this thoracic region. Again, this just has to do with how it's uh, pushing down on the lungs, how it's not providing a proper area for the lungs. Uh, then you have kyphosis. Now, kyphosis, this is uh, also known as hunchback. So this is abnormal dorsal thoracic curvature. And it's common uh, with people in, with, that have osteoporosis, uh, tuberculosis of your spine, rickets, or osteomalacia. There's another condition called lordosis. Now, in lordosis, it's also known as swayback. So what you end up seeing is uh, you, you end up seeing an, uh, an uh, excessive lumbar, uh, excessive curvature of the spine in the lumbar region. And uh, so this can result from diseases, but is also seen in men that have pot bellies and in pregnant women. So when you look over here, this is scoliosis. Notice how you have this axis, uh, you, you have this uh, uh, lateral rotation of your thoracic spine uh, over here. To, uh, that's uh, uh, push more towards this side, uh, towards the, the, the left side. Than it is towards the right, and then you look over here. This is this kyphosis over here. So this the hunchback. Then if you look over here in lordosis, again you have this axis uh, anterior curvature of your lumbar spine. So again over here you're seeing this in the lumbar spine. Uh, kyphosis, generally speaking, you'll tend to see in the the, the thoracic region, the thoracic spine. Uh, in this oscoliosis is also, again, more commonly, again, you can see this at anywhere, but again, you, you'll tend to see this in, in the thoracic region as well, uh, more so. Now we're going to be looking at the general structure of the vertebrae. Now all vertebrae, they have a common structural pattern. Each vertebrae is made up of a body or a centrum anteriorly and a vertebral arch posteriorly. Now the dish-shaped body this is the weight-bearing region. Now, together the body and the vertebral arch, they enclose an opening that's called the vertebral foramen. Now, as you end up having these successive vertebral uh, foramina of the articulating vertebrates, they end up forming a long vertebral canal. And through this vertebral canal, you have the spinal cord that passes through. The vertebral arch, this is a composite structure formed by two pedicles and two laminae. Now the pedicles, uh, these are short bony pillars that are projecting posteriorly from the vertebral body, uh, from the side of the arch. Now the laminae, uh, these are flattened plates that fuse in the median uh, plane. Uh, com they complete the arch posteriorly. The pedicles, they have notches on their superior and inferior borders that provide lateral openings between the adjacent vertebrae. These are called the intervertebral foramina. Now the spinal nerves uh, from the spinal cord, they pass through these foramina. So when you look over here at this picture, this is a typical vertebrae. And notice what we have posteriorly, you have the spinous process. Uh, these are the transverse process. Now this is a lamina and these are the pedicles. Okay, it's a pedicle, lamina, and this is the, the body. Okay, the vertebral body, and right here you have the the vertebral foramina, and this is when you start stacking up, you know, back one on top of another vertebrae and on top of another vertebrae. All these foramina they end up forming the uh, the vertebral canal that the spinal cord is going to be passing through. Now, seven processes they project from the vertebral arch. Uh, the spinous process. This is a median posterior projecting that uh, that arises at the junction of the two laminae. Now a transverse process, it extends laterally from each side of the vertebral arch. The spinous and the transverse process, uh, uh, these are attachment sites for muscles that move the vertebral columns uh, and for ligaments uh, that stabilize it. Now there's a paired superior and inferior articular processes that protrude superiorly and inferiorly from the pedicle lamina junctions. Uh, the smooth joint surface of the articular process are called the facets. Uh, now these are covered with hyaline cart cartilage. The inferior articular process of each vertebrae, they form movable joints with the superior articular process of the vertebrae immediately below it. So these successive vertebrae, they join both at their bodies and at their articular processes. So when you look over here, uh, again you have this vertebrae and uh, so this is the body. So now when you think about it, when each of these backbones, 
let's look over here. When each of these back ones are sitting on top of one another and they're stacked up, uh, they're coming together at the bodies. But in addition to that, uh, the superior articular, <clears throat> excuse me, facet of this vertebrae is going to be art uh, it's going to be in contact or connecting, sitting on top of the inferior articular facet of this vertebrae. And similarly, the inferior articular facet of this vertebrae is going to be sitting and resting with uh, the superior articular facet of this vertebrae. Uh, now we're going to be looking at uh, each one of these uh, individual regions uh, of the vertebrae. So the cervical vertebrae, there are seven of them. Remember, C1 through C7. Remember, the C stands for cervical. Uh, so uh, C1 and C2, they're very unique, and we're going to be looking at these two individually. But uh, let's look at uh, C3 to C7. Now, they share the following uh, features uh, that they have in common. Uh, they have oval bodies, so it's wider from side to side than in the anterior posterior dimension. With the exception of C7, the spinous process is short and they project di directly back. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a bifid or a split at, at, at its tip. Now, the vertebral foramen, uh, they are, they're large and generally it's triangular in shape. Now, each transverse process, it also contains a transverse foramen. Uh, through this transverse foramen, the vertebral arteries, uh, they're able to pass and uh, penetrate and go into the brain. Now, the spinous process uh, of C7, it's not bifid and is much larger than those of the other cervical uh, vertebrae. Because its, its spinous process is palpable through your skin, C7 can be used as a landmark for counting the vertebrae. And, you, and it's called uh, the, ver the vertebrae prominence. So if you bend your head downwards and you run your hands through it, and that first bump that you feel, that large bump, this is it. This is his vertebral prominence. And you know that right over here, which bone, which, which uh, vertebral bone it is. So if you do that again, then you know this is where the, the cervical spine ends and then where the thoracic is going to be starting uh, moving below that point. So when you look at this graph, it uh, helps summarize uh, the characteristics of uh, the, uh, the bones that we find in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar region. So notice, again, in the, the cervical region, uh, the body... Uh, of these vertebrae, they're small, oval, and they're wide side to side. Whereas in the thoracic region, these are large, uh, larger than the cervical. Uh, they have a heart; sh they're heart shaped, and they bear two costal facets. And this is the, the these costal facets. This is what uh, articulates with your uh, your costals, your, your ribs. Uh, whereas in the lumbar region, these are very massive. Uh, it has a very massive body uh, that's uh, almost kidney shaped. The spinous processes uh, in cervical, they're bifid, they're short, uh, and it projects directly posterior. Whereas in the thoracic, we have these long, sharp uh, uh, spinous processes, and it projects inferiorly. Whereas in the lumbar region, you have these short, blunt, rectangular uh, spinous projects that uh, project directly posterior, similar to what we saw in the, the spinous process, uh, in, the, in the cervical uh, vertebrae. Uh, the vertebral foramen in uh, the cervical uh, spine, these are large and they're triangle, uh, triangular. In the thoracic region, they're circular, and then back in the lumbar region, they are triangular again. Now, the transverse, for, uh, for, uh, the transverse foramen uh, in the cervical region, they have foramina. In the thoracic region, uh, the transverse processes, uh, they have facets for you, the, the ribs. The ribs. Now, the exception is your uh, T11, T12. They don't have these facets. And the lumbar region, uh, they're thin and tapered. Now, superior inferior articular processes uh, for cervical uh, 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 C3 to C7, um, superior facets are di directed po superior posteriorly, the inferior facets are directed inferior uh, anteriorly. In the thoracic, uh, the superior facets, they're directed posteriorly, and the inferior facets are di directed anteriorly. In the lumbar, the superior facets are directed posterior immediately, and inferior facets are directed anterior laterally. Uh, now, the movements that are allowed. So, your cervical uh, spine, you have the most movement that you find over here. Okay, You have flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation. Uh, the spine region with the greatest range of motion is right over here, Okay, undoubtedly. Um, now, thoracic region, you have over here rotation uh, that's lateral flexion is possible, 
uh, but it's restricted by your ribs. Uh, flexion and extension is also limited. Now, uh, at your lumbar region, you have flexion and extension. Uh, you have some lateral flexion, uh, and rotation is prevented. So when you look over here, uh, again, notice this is a cervical, a thoracic, and a lumbar vertebrae. Notice they are all differently shaped. Uh, so over here, you can see the superior articular facets over here, uh, and then uh, this is your your uh, your right uh, superior articular facet, and you have your left superior articular facet. Body. Notice the body, how different it is in shape in cervical versus uh, for the thoracic and the the lumbar. This is by far the largest. It's almost like a a bean shaped uh, body that that uh, that's present over here, whereas over here it's more of an oval shaped structure. Uh, and again, if you look at uh, the spinous process, notice that they're all very different as well. Very sharp over here. Uh, this is pointing downwards. Where it, over here, you have this little split over here that we talked about earlier. This is one of the, the key uh, uh, distinguishing points for the cervical vertebrae. Um, the transverse process over here, notice there is foramen, the, the, the transverse foramen over here. And only the, your uh, cervical spine will have these transverse foramen. Uh, for, for uh, the rest of them will not. Your thoracic and lumbar will not have them. They lack these transverse foramen. Um, also, so uh, the vertebral, uh, the thoracic uh, vertebrae, they have these transverse uh, co coastal facets, costal facets, which are not present in the cervical or uh, the lumbar spine. Uh, also notice the shape of the, the, the transverse process uh, that are present. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> These are uh, very uh, flat, and again, they're coming out perpendicularly. Whereas over here, they're more at, more at an angle in the thoracic, uh, uh, the thoracic spine, uh, the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, so I think that's about it for this that we can look at. And again, you can see the superior articular facets how they're different uh, than the, what we find over here in the vertebral, in the the cervical spine. Um, and there we go, we have uh, another view over here. And we can see clearly, again, the size of the bodies is very evident on their size, how, how much of a difference there is. This is by far the largest, okay, the lumbar vertebrae. These are the biggest uh, vertebrae that we have in our body. Uh, so notice that uh, the, in the articular processes, they're much, much, they, they extend much longer than, the, than they do in the thoracic and the uh, uh, the, the cervical spine uh, in, in the lumbar, uh, the, the lumbar vertebrae, I'm sorry, in the cervical vertebrae and the lumbar vertical brain, respectively. Um, so yeah, again, this is a superior cosset, uh, co costal facet over here. Again, this is going to be articulating with the rib. Uh, then you have your transverse process over here, and this is the transverse uh, costal facet for uh, the, uh, uh, the rib also. Uh, So the ribs, they actually articulate, there's two parts of the rib that articulate with it. Uh, the head, this is where it comes and attaches to over here. And then there's a bump on the neck of the, the rib. There's a, and that bump, it's gonna articulate, or it's a tubercle that articulates with uh, this, uh, the, the transverse uh, uh, co costal facet over here. So there's actually two points of attachment for the ribs uh, that they make uh, with your uh, vertebrae. So you can see over here uh, that uh, these are the seven bones that we're looking at. Uh, so uh, you have right over here uh, your uh, atlas. This is what uh, C1 is called. C1 is called the atlas, and C2 is called the axis. Okay, so atlas and axis. Then you have C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. Uh, remember, C7 is referred to as the, the, the vertebrae, uh, the vertebra. Uh, prominence because of this over here. Note the spinal stress is very different. It's, it's, it's quite large. So this is that first big bump that you feel right off the smooth part of your neck, the back of your neck. Um, so yeah, you can't really see too much over here. Uh, except where this is the transverse ligament that you see over here. Uh, these are this is the dens of the axis you see over here. Now uh, this part is going to be articulating with your skull, okay? So C1, as I said, and C2, they are very unique. 
first of all, C1 is a bone that allows you to move your head from side, uh, from uh, uh, up, uh, up and down, okay? So when you're nodding, yes, this is the bone that's allowing you to do that. It's C1. And when you move your head from side to side, and like in a no, that's C2. C1, uh, it, uh, as we said earlier, it is called the atlas, and it lacks a, uh, a body or a spinous process. So it's made up of anterior and posterior arches, and it's two lateral masses. Now, the superior surface uh, of the lateral masses, it articulates with the occipital condyle. So this is uh, what's carrying the skull. This is the, the, the bone that's holding your skull in place and carrying it there. Uh, is this atlas. So when you look over here, uh, again, notice that there is not a body over here. Uh, instead, you have this huge hole, okay, the, 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 this opening over here. And this is where the, 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 the spinal cord uh, is going to be connecting with uh, the brain. Uh, so this is the posterior aspect. This is the anterior aspect. So the, this is the posterior tubercle, the anterior tubercle. This is the anterior arch over here. And this is the posterior arches over here. Uh, this is the transverse foramen uh, over here. Here you go, on the, on the one on the other side. And this is a superior articular facet over here. Uh, another view over here, you can see the, the inferior articular facet over here. Uh, and this is the, the facet for the dens. Um, again, you can see the transverse process over here as well. So the axis, now this has a body and processes like other vertebrae. Now the major feature is this knob-like dens uh, that projects superiorly and uh, into anterior arch of the atlas. Now the dens is the missing body of the atlas. All right, so it acts as a pivot for rotation of the atlas. So this allows you to nod your head or move your head uh, from side to side uh, when you you know when you're saying when you're nodding your head no. So when you're looking over here. Again, this is the spinous process. Uh, now here's the lamina, and this is the pedicle over here that you can see. Uh, this is the inferior articular process that you see here. Uh, this is uh, the, the den right over here. Uh, so this is what this bone is going to be pivoting. Uh, it's going to pivot with the C1. Uh, this is the, the transverse process, and this is the superior articular facet over here. Again, uh, this is an actual picture of a, a, a C2. Uh, your axis. So again, you can see the the the, the spines pro process over here. This is superior articular facet over here. Uh, you can see uh, it's very difficult to see the transverse foramen uh, uh, within this transverse process. Uh, but then, with very clearly, you can see the dens. So once again, this is the dens. Now notice how it's coming up, it's sticking upwards. All right. So this kind of helps form the the body for C1. Uh, Okay, and this part, this is what your uh, the skull is going to be carried on. Okay, this is what, what it's going to be articulating with the superior facets over here of C1. It's going to be holding, uh, articulating with this occipital condyle of the, uh, the the skull. So when you go back over here, back to C1, uh, right over here, uh, yeah, these superior articular facets are going to be articulating with, articulating with the occipital condyles to hold the skull in place, to carry the skull. Uh, so, yeah, let's move forward. So now we're going to be looking at thoracic vertebrae. Now, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae that are uh, number T1 through T12, and they all articulate with your ribs. Now, the very first thoracic vertebrae, T1, it looks a lot like C7, and the very last vertebrae, T12, it's starting to look a lot like uh, your first lumbar vertebrae, L1. So what we're seeing is this. We're seeing that these thoracic vertebrae, as they, uh, from T1 all the way down to T12, is that they're increasing in size, is that they're getting bigger. Now, while this may be the case, uh, they, they all still share uh, characteristics which are unique to these thoracic vertebrae. So let's start looking. We're going to take a closer look at this. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we notice is that the body, it it uh, somewhat resembles a heart-shaped structure. Uh, they also, uh, it also typically bears two small facets that are called the, the, the demi facets on each side. So one is at the superior edge, uh, which is the, the superior coastal facet, and the other is at the inferior edge, which is the inferior coast, uh, costal facet. 
Now, the demi facets they receive the heads of the ribs. Um, now, the bodies of T10 and T12, they vary from this pattern by having only a single facet to receive these uh, the respective ribs. The main reason why is because T11 and T12, as you get there, you're going to see, is that they're different. Uh, because your 11th and 12th ribs, they're uh, these are not true ribs, actually. They're what we call the floating ribs. So their shape is going to be, they're going to be very different in appearance uh, and their uh, structure. So the second thing is, uh, the vertebral foramen is circular. Uh, the spinous process is long and it points sharply downwards. Now, with the exception of T11 and T12, as I mentioned earlier, the transverse process, they have facets, which are called the transverse costal facets. Now, this is what articulates with the tubercle of the ribs. Uh, the superior inferior articular facets, uh, they lie mainly in the frontal plane. Now, what this does is that it prevents flexion and extension. But, at the same time, th it allows this area of the spine to rotate. So, again, this is the same chart we went over already, so I'm not going to review this again. But you can notice all this, the, the things that we just discussed uh, you know, about, uh, the, the thoracic, uh, uh, vertebrae, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, this chart over here. Uh, so moving forward, again, we've already examined this. So notice that, uh, here, these are the superior articular, uh, process and, and facets that we have over here. This is the process, it's the facet right over there. This is the spinous process. Notice that it points, it's, well, it's a little bit difficult to see, but it, it's pointing downwards sharply. These are the transverse process and on the transverse facets, uh, fast, uh, processes, you have the, uh, the, the facels, the, the costal facels, uh, where the tubercle of the ribs are going to be articulating with. Um, and then, so this is the, the body of it. And again, they kind of describe, uh, uh, they describe this as a, I don't know, a heart shaped, uh, somewhat resembles a heart shaped structure. So if you kind of use your imagination, there you go. This is how they come up with that. Um, let's move forward. Uh, so again, <clears throat> this is a again a, 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 another view. So you, clearly, you can see the superior articular uh, uh, process over here, and there is a the facet uh, that you can see over here. This is the transverse uh, coastal uh, facet to here. This is where the the, the tubercle of the ribs is going to be articulating. This is right over here. Uh, and again, that's uh, another the other transverse process over there. This is the spinous process. Notice how it just it sharply comes downwards. Okay, it goes down. Um, and again, this is the inferior articular process over here. Now, uh, the next thing we're going to be looking at are the lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar region of the vertebral column, uh, column uh, it's commonly referred to as the small of your back. And this is the part that receives the most stress. Uh, so pretty much all the weight from the upper part of your body, it's all coming down to this part. And again, this is one of the reasons why most back injuries, they occur over here within the lumbar region. Uh, so there's five bones over here. Uh, they're numbered uh, L1 through L5, lumbar 1, lumbar 2, lumbar 3, and lumbar 4, and lumbar 5. Uh, now, the bodies are massive, uh, and when you look at the bodies, they're kidney-shaped. Uh, so these are fairly large uh, vertebrae, and they're very sturdy. And again, the reason is because, you know, they bear, you know, this is, it's the most stressful part. Uh, uh, these are the most stress-loading and weight-loading. Uh, vertebrae of the body. All the stress comes over here. So they need to be uh, much different in their structure also. Uh, now, so let's look at some of the, the characteristics uh, that these uh, vertebrae share. Now, the pedicle and the, and the laminae, they're much shorter. Uh, however, uh, they are much more thicker than uh, of the other, other vertebrae. The spinous process, they're short, they're flat, uh, and they're hatchet-shaped. And they're easily seen when a person bends forward. Uh, these processes are robust and they project directly backwards. So uh, this allows uh, some of these larger back muscles to attach uh, relatively easier. Also, the foramen for the uh, the, the vertebral foramen, its its uh, shape is it's different. Also, it's triangular. Now, the orientation of the facets of the articular process of these lumbar vertebrae, they also differ from uh, those of the other type of vertebrae that we have. Now, these modifications. Uh, they, uh, what they do is they lock the lumbar vertebrae together. And what this locking does is it provides uh, more stability uh, because now you're not going to get this rotation of your lumbar spine. 
Um, flexion and extension, they're, uh, they are still possible. When you're doing uh, side bends and, uh, and sit-ups, uh, it's because of, uh, you know, these lumbar vertebrae and the type of uh, the, uh, the, these modification that occurs over here that uh, it's, uh, you know, you're able to do these exercises. Again, we have these, uh, the, the chart over here that we just went over, the lumbar uh, vertebrae. So you can refer back to these again. Uh, I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, again, we have the same thing over here. Notice the body is much larger than any of these. It's a bean-shaped where you had over here, you had this uh, heart-shaped, uh, and then here you had this uh, this oval shape. So now you've got this bean-shaped structure here. It's, this is the, the largest vertebrae, if you notice over here. Also notice the, uh, the, the, how the, uh, the, the transverse process and the spinous process, they're very different from any of the, uh, all these rest, uh, the rest of the, the, these uh, other vertebrae types. Uh, again, here's a side view. Notice the spinous, how the spinous process is. It's much larger, thicker, and it attaches for a lot of these muscles, these larger muscles to come and attach to. Uh, same thing with the transverse process. Uh, very different than what we had over here. And there's no ribs over, uh, over here. So this is the inferior articular process and facet over here that you see. Uh, here's a superior uh, articular process over there. You cannot see the facet, unfortunately. Uh, again, you can see these, how these two uh, uh, lumbar vertebrae are sitting on top of one another. Uh, so here's the superior articular process you can see here, and you can see the, the inferior articular process uh, facet over here. So this is a superior articular facet, inferior articular facet. Inferior articular process, superior articular process over there. Uh, the transverse process are here, and then uh, you can see uh, the, so yeah, the body sitting over here, and you can see how these facets, uh, how they end up holding. So this guy over here, this, thing you, this facet you see here, it's uh, holding on. Is going to be holding the, the vertebrae that's on top of it. So this is what you're seeing over here. So they're holding each other at two places, uh, over here and then also at the body. That's where they come into contact with one another from. And of course, you have the spinous process. Now we're going to be talking about uh, the sacrum. So the sacrum, this is a, it's a triangular-shaped bone. Uh, and it's, a, you know, there are five bones that are, that are fused together that form uh, the, the, the sacrum. Now, the sacrum, it forms the posterior wall of the pelvis. Uh, uh, and again, in adults, these bones, they're fused. Uh, then they're numbered S1 through S5. Now, it articulates superiorly uh, via the, the superior articular process uh, with the L5 and inferiorly uh, with the cossacks. Okay? Or, uh, and laterally, the sacrum, it articulates uh, via its uh, auricular surfaces with the two hip bones uh, to form the sacroiliac joint. Now, the sacro pr uh, promontory, uh, this is a high point uh, that's, that's projecting uh, upwards. So the anterior superior margins uh, of the first um, uh, of the first sacral vertebrae, it bulges anteriorly into the pelvic cavity. Now, the, the sacral promontory, uh, this is an inward um, inward projecting anterior part of S1, your first sacral bone. Um, now you find that this uh, the, uh, this uh, the sacral promontory it's bulging anteriorly into the pelvic cavity. Now the body's uh, center of gravity it's about one centimeter posterior to this landmark. Uh, there's also four ridges that we find, which we call the transverse ridges. Now uh, we find these transverse ridges uh, on the the anterior aspect of the sacrum. And these are the lines uh, that show uh, the where these uh, the sacral bones have fused together. Now, uh, the anterior sacral foramina, they lie at the lateral ends of these ridges, and they transmit blood vessels and uh, anterior rami of the sac sacral spinal nerves. Now, the regions lateral to this foramina, they expand superiorly as the wing-like ala. Now, um, in the posterior midline uh, of the sacrum, the sacral surface appears roughened by the median sacral crest. Now, these are the, the fused spinous process of the sacral vertebrae. Uh, now, this is flanked laterally by the posterior sacral foramina. Now, this transmits the posterior rami of the sacral spinal nerves and, the, and then the lateral sacral crest, which are the remnants uh, of the, the transverse process of uh, 
S1 through S5. Now, the vertebral canal, it continues inside the sacrum as a circle canal. Since the lamina of the fifth and sometimes the fourth circle vertebrae, they fail to fuse medially, uh, an enlarged external opening called the sacral hiatus uh, is visible uh, at the inferior end of the sacral canal. Now, the very last bone is the caustics. Uh, this is also known as our tailbone. It's a small triangular bone, and it's made up of uh, anywhere from three to five bones uh, that are fused together. Uh, the caustics, it articulates superiorly with the sacrum. Um, now, as far as this function, there really is no function, uh, you know, that they think. It, it may give, uh, you know, it, it may provide slight support uh, uh, to the pelvic organs. Uh, th th that's about it. Uh, but, uh, again, at this point, the scientists, they're, they're, they don't believe that this uh, bone serves any function. Uh, but you know that could be yeah, they could be wrong about that. Uh, we, we don't know what's gonna, what they're going to say. You know, ten years down the line, as more research develops, more information comes out. So uh, here you go. This is your your sacrum, and uh, these are the the ridges, see, these transverse ridges, and this is the sites where these one, two, three, four, these five sacral vertebrae they, they fuse together. So when they fuse together, uh, this is where they. Uh, these are the run. These lines signify where they came together, fused. Now, this is that sacral uh, uh, promontory that we were talking about. Uh, so, if you're going to look at it from, if you had a superior view, you'd be able to see the body of the sacrum over here. Uh, these are the ala of the uh, of the sacrum. Uh, these are the anterior sacral foramina that you see over here, and this is the caustics here. So, one, two, three. Notice this in this bone. There's four. Uh, th this caustic is made of four fused bones. Uh, in some people, there may be three. In others, there may be four. Um, so again, uh, this is another posterior view of the uh, uh, of the sacrum. And again, you can see the caustics over here. You, you have the same four bones over here. Uh, and uh, what you see over here are this is uh, the median sacral crust. Okay, so these are the spinous processes that are fused uh, of these five uh, sacral bones. Uh, this is the 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 facet of the superior articular process. Over here, uh, again, this is the body uh, uh, of S1 that you see over here. Uh, again, this is the ala over here. And this is uh, the auricular surface. And you can see the lateral sacral crest here. Also, you can see the sacral canal over here. And this is that sacral hiatus that we mentioned that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this pretty much does it for uh, your, your, uh, your vertebral column. Now we're going to be going to the thoracic cage. So when we looked at the thoracic cage, uh, it's also referred to as uh, the, the the bony thorax. Uh, so again, more commonly, what we're, uh, to, to the average person, uh, we're talking about uh, the chest, okay, the chest region, the thorax. Uh, now, elements uh, that are part of your thoracic cage, they include uh, your thoracic vertebrae, which are located uh, posteriorly. Uh, so. Posteriorly, these thoracic vertebrae, they will articulate uh, and they hold in place your costals, which are the ribs. And these car car uh, costals, they uh, encompass or make up uh, the, the, the lateral aspect of this thoracic cage. And then anteriorly, they connect to the sternum via the coastal cartilages. Um, now, these coastal cartilages, they anchor onto the, the sternum, which is the breastbone. Uh, now, what are the functions for uh, your uh, the, the thoracic uh, cage? So as to the functions uh, for the thoracic cage, uh, one of the most important things it, it, uh, that it does is it protects these vital organs uh, th that are found within. So when you look at your heart, if there is damage to the heart, it's irreversible. All right, and then you know you will not live very long uh, if the, the the damage is extent. Same thing with the lungs. Uh, so both of these organs, they're very well protected. Uh, in addition to that, you have the largest blood vessel that leaves uh, the the body uh, and that enters uh, the the heart, uh, which are the the aorta and the superior inferior vena cava. Now both of these blood vessels, if they're damaged, uh, then that's a huge problem. Death can uh, result very very. Uh, quickly if it's not uh, treated uh, in a timely fashion, within minutes. 
Uh, the thoracic cage, it also supports the sho shoulder girdles and your upper limbs, and it provides attachment points for many of the muscles of your neck, your back, chest, and shoulder. Now, the intercostal spaces that are found between the ribs, uh, they're occupied by the intercostal muscles. And now, these muscles, they lift and they, they depress the thorax during breathing. So here you go, this is your thoracic cage, and uh, what you'll see over here is that, uh, let's just look at the, the different parts first of all. So this is your sternum. Now the sternum uh, uh, is actually two bones that are fused to get it together. So this is the manubrium, uh, this is the, called the, the body of the sternum, and this is called, this part right here is the, is this, the, the xiphoid process of the sternum, this sharp part here. Uh, so there's actually three parts to this, uh, to the breastbone, to the sternum. Uh, notice anteriorly, the costals, they, uh, your ribs, they connect to the sternum by way of these costal cart cartilages. Okay, and then uh, the, uh, posteriorly, uh, your costals, they articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, notice these 11th and 12th uh, ribs, they're not, uh, uh, actually, yeah, it's uh, right over here. The 11th and 12th uh, ribs, uh, or costals, they don't articulate with uh, your sternum. So these are called the floating ribs your 11th and 12th uh, ribs, costals. Uh, what else do you see? So we look at the costal cartilages. Uh, so yeah, these are the true ribs, the first, uh, the uh, ribs number one through seven, because they all connect directly to uh, the, the rib by way of these costal cartilages. So if you look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right over here, this is the seventh. Notice that they all have uh, uh, their own cartilage that goes and connects them directly. Now, when you look over here, your ribs eight through 12, uh, well, eight, nine, and 10. Now, they're all sharing this cartilage over here, okay? Uh, this is, uh, they end up sharing this cartilage that ends up getting connected uh, to the costal, the, the main cartilage, uh, costal cartilage uh, of uh, uh, costal uh, number seven. Uh, that's what connects them over here. So because they don't have their own uh, costal cartilages that connects them directly to the sternum, they're called the false ribs. And then finally, uh, the floating ribs, they have no cartilage at all that connects them to uh, the, the sternum. So therefore, they, they're called the floating ribs. Uh, so the sternum is also called the breastbone. And then like I said before, it's made up of three bones that are fused. Uh, the superiormost part is called the manubrium, um, and it articulates with the clavicula, clavicula notches and ribs one and ribs two, ribs one and two. Another thing I wanted to mention to you is that uh, the sternum, it lies in the anterior midline of your thorax, uh, which is also, it's almost directly, almost directly behind the heart. Uh, the heart is slightly more to your left, slightly more to, to the left of the sternum. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the reasons it's a little bit more to the left of the sternum is because, uh, you know, the, the left lung is a little bit larger, so it kind of pushes it to the side. Uh, now, uh, I'm sorry, the, the right lung is slightly a little bit larger uh, than the left lung. So the, the, your right lung is kind of pushing or displacing the, your, your, uh, your heart a little bit more towards the left side, which makes your left lungs a little bit smaller, slightly smaller. Uh, the left lungs, they actually have two lobes. The right lung has uh, three lobes to it. So uh, this uh, this dagger shaped uh, sternum, it's a flat bone and it's roughly six, six inches long. Um, now, this bone, the sternum, it's also uh, the main bone that CPR is done on. So, like I said, you know, because the heart is you know behind it, uh, when you're doing CPR, you're compressing, you're pushing down on this bone, and as you're pushing down on this bone, uh, this bone is able to move because of the, car the, the the cartilages that it's attached to. So remember those costal cartilages that are at attaching to it. Well, that cartilage is flexible, so when you push down on it, uh, you're actually able to move this bone and uh, squeeze the heart against it. And then when you let go, it recoils, so the, the, the sternum will end up retracting back to its original state. Laterally on the, the, the maneuverum, you have the clavic clavicular notches, which are articulating with the clavicles. And then also, again, as I mentioned earlier, you have your uh, ribs uh, uh, one and two that are articulating uh, with it medially. Now, the body of the sternum, this is the mid portion, and it articulates with the costal cartilages directly of ribs uh, two through ribs seven. Now, the sides of the body, they're notched where it's articulates with these car costal cartilages. Uh, so when you look, if, you, if you're able to see, the, uh, see a sternum, you'll see these notches that are present. Uh, 
Again, this is in the, in dried tissue, of course. Typhoid process, process uh, it forms the, the inferior end of the sternum. Now, this is a small, uh, it's like an arrow-shaped uh, part of the bone. And uh, in youth, usually this is a, it, it's, it's, it's a plate of hyaline cartilages. But by the time, you know, uh, you reach age 40, it calcifies and it's, it's, it's a hard bone. Uh, the xiphoid process, it articulates uh, with the sternal body and it serves as an attachment point for some of your abdominal muscles. Now, the sternum has three imp important anatomical landmarks. Uh, the jugular notch, the sternal edge, and the xiphi sternal joint. Now, the jugular notch, you can easily palpate that. Uh, it's just superior to the, the sternum. Uh, this is the central indentation of the superior border of the maneuverum. So if you slide your f uh, finger down the anterior surface of your ne neck, uh, you're going to end up coming down to that jugular notch. Now, the jugular notch is generally in line with the disc between the second and third thoracic vertebrae. Now, the sternal angle, it's felt as a horizontal ridge across the front of the sternum where the maneuvering joins the sternal body. Now, this cartilaginous joint, it acts like a hinge along the sternal body to swing anteriorly when we inhale. So, uh, the sternal angle uh, is in line with the disc between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae, and it's also at the level of the second pair of ribs. Now, this is a, uh, a handy reference point for finding your second rib uh, and for counting uh, the ribs during a physical exam. Uh, this kind of helps uh, you uh, to, to listen for sounds that are made, for example, you know, if you're listening to, to heart sounds, uh, heart valve sounds, uh, and you, you, you have these landmarks known, you'll, you'll know where to place the stethoscope at so you can easily uh, hear uh, the valves opening and closing. The xiphi sternal joint, this is a point where the sternal body and the xiphoid process, uh, they fuse together. Now it lies at the level of the ninth thoracic vertebrae. So over here, this is a cross section and you can see uh, this is the heart right over here. So notice that the heart lies right around T4. All right, uh, just slightly below T4. And this is where that sternal angle is, all right? So this is the maneuvering right up over here. And notice, again, where is this? At T2, you have the maneuvering starting. Uh, so, and then right over here, right at T9, this is where the heart ends. And this is the diaphragm that you see over here. Um, and right above, slightly above, right around the, the this uh, T9, you have this uh, xiphi sternal joint. So this is the, the xiphoid process down over here. This is the body of the, st uh, the sternum over here. Uh, right there, and uh, yeah, this is the maneuverum up over here. Now, so the xiphoid process, it projects posteriorly in some people. Uh, so a blow to the chest, so chest trauma at the level of the xiphoid process, it can push that process into the, to the heart or also the liver. And this could cause uh, death right away if it's not corrected. Uh, if you have that heart that's pierced uh, or that liver that's pierced, there's going to be a lot of internal bleeding. And uh, especially in the case of the heart, because uh, remember, what do you have around that heart? If that when that blood starts pulling up, you're going to have, uh, uh, first of all, you're going to have compression on the heart itself. So the heart's not going to be, uh, the heart's going to be compressed. It's not going to be able to pump properly. Uh, now, additionally, uh, if heart starts leaking around within that cavity, and now you have uh, blood that's pulling up within the thoracic, uh, the thoracic uh, cavity, it's going to start pushing down on, uh, the lungs. Now, once that happens, now you cannot breathe. You're not. You're not able. The air is not able to come inside the lungs uh, because there's so much pressure inside uh, uh, the this thoracic cavity that the lungs cannot fill up with air. So both these things they can result in death. Uh, you need to get to a trauma center. That patient needs to get to a trauma center right away. Uh, next, we will be talking about your ribs. So uh, there are twelve pairs of ribs that we have in the human body. Uh, these 12 pairs of ribs, uh, they form the flaring sides of the thoracic cage. Now, all the ribs, they're attached posteriorly to the thoracic vertebrae, uh, <clears throat> and they curve inferiorly towards the anterior body surface. Now, the superior seven ribs, uh, uh, the seven pairs of ribs, they attach directly to the sternum by these coastal cartilages. And because of that, we call these the true ribs, or the vertebrosternal ribs. That's another term that's used. Now, the remaining five pairs of ribs, these are called the false ribs because they uh, I, they either attach indirectly to the sternum or they don't lack at all, which is the, the floating ribs, your 11th and 12th ribs. So uh, 
pairs 8, ribs pairs uh, 8 through 10, they attach to the sternum indirectly, each joining the costal cartilage immediately above it. Uh, these ribs are also called the, the vertebrochondral ribs, the vertebrochondral ribs. Uh, the inferior margins of the rib cage, uh, or the coastal margin, is formed by the coastal cartilages of ribs 7 through 10. Now, ribs uh, pairs uh, 11 and 12, as I, mentioned, or, or shield, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are called the floating ribs. Uh, another term that's used are vertebral ribs, because, again, because they have no anterior attachments. Uh, instead, these ca cartilages, uh, they, they're embedded uh, within the muscles of the lateral body walls. Uh, now, Again, when you, some of these uh, singers or these actresses, I think, uh, what was it, Shakira, uh, you know, she had the surgery to make her waist a little bit smaller. So cosmetically, some people, they will get these ribs removed to, to, to having a, a, a very slim waistline. Uh, these, these are the ribs that they end up removing, uh, ribs 12 uh, and 11. Now, Let's take a picture. Uh, let's take a look at, the, at this picture over here. So again, this is the, the, the body of the sternum right over here. This is the manubrium. This is the sternal angle. So this is where the manubrium and the body, uh, they come together, they fuse. And this is a xiphoid process right over here. Okay, And this is a xiphoid sternal joint. Uh, so notice that this is uh, it's cartilage, but then usually around the age of 40, this will calcify. Uh, these, again, pairs 1 through 7, these are the true ribs because they all have their own cartilage. Then 8, 9, and 10, they share a cartilage with the ones right above them. Uh, so these are called the false ribs, uh, in addition to 11th and 12th, which are referred to as the floating ribs. So notice these two guys over here, they're only anchored to the, the T11 and T12 respectively. Um, now, between them, you have your intercostal spaces, and within these intercostal spaces, you have muscles. And these are the muscles that help uh, the, the, the rib cage expand and, and contract So while you're breathing. Um, so again, that helps with the lungs, uh, that helps with the lungs uh, uh, compress and expand as well. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, you can see the coastal margins over here. And uh, I think that's it for that part, for that photo. Now, a typical rib is a, it's a bowed flat bone. Uh, from pairs 1 through pair 7, these ribs, they increase in length. And then from pairs 8 through 12, they start to shorten in length again. Uh, now, the bulk of the rib is simply called a shaft. Its superior border is smooth, but its inferior border is sharp and thin. And it has a coastal groove in its inner face that holds the intercostal nerves and blood vessels in place. Now, in addition to the shaft, uh, each rib it has a head, neck, and tubercle. Now, the wedge-shaped head, uh, the posterior end, articulates with the vertebral bodies of, by the two facets. Now, one joins the body of the same uh, number of thoracic vertebrae, and the uh, other, it articulates with the body of the, uh, the vertebrae immediately superior to it. Now, uh, the neck uh, of, the, uh, of your, uh, the, the ribs, it's a constricted portion of the rib, just beyond the head. Now, lateral to this, there's a knob-like tubercle that articulates with the coastal facets of the transverse process of the same number thoracic vertebrae. Now, beyond the tubercle, the shaft angles sharply forward, uh, and then it extends to attach to the coastal cartilage anteriorly. Uh, the coastal cartilage provides a secure, uh, but still at the same time, it's a, a flexible uh, rib attachment to the sternum. And again, it's because of this that, you know, we're able to do CPR and to be able to compress the sternum uh, so the, the heart can be squeezed to pump the blood artificially. Uh, so as you look over here at this photo, uh, so this is the shaft. Now, this is the largest part of the rib, okay, the shaft. And notice, uh, so this is the, the posterior aspect. This is the anterior aspect. So notice over here, you have this coastal cartilage that's attached to the, uh, to the shaft of the uh, the, the costal, uh, and then to the sternum over here. Now, as you're going back, uh, what do we have here? Uh, is the this is the tubercle of the rib right over here? That's going to be uh, articulating with the 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 with the vertebrae, uh, and then uh, what else do we see? Uh, so yeah, the, so this is a transverse coastal facet. So this tubercle over here is articulates right over here with the transverse coastal facet. Again, this is another view. So notice here, 
This is your rib over here. This is an articular facet on the tubercle of the rib. And then notice how it's articulating over here with the transverse coastal facet of the, the thoracic vertebrae. Okay. And then uh, what do you have over here? You have the, the, the superior coastal facet that this rib is articulating with on this end. Okay. Uh, so you got two points of attachment uh, for it. There's also ligaments that help hold it in place as well. Uh, so, and again, this is another picture of, of a rib. Uh, so this is a junction with the coastal cartilage right over here. This is at the end that's going to be attaching with uh, the sternum uh, by, uh, via the coastal cartilage. Uh, so again, this is the shaft. This is the bulk of it. Now this right here, this is the angle of the rib. So this is the part that's starting to curve, uh, curve backwards sharply uh, to go and, and finally attach with uh, the, the, the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, so these are the facets that are going to be articulating with the vertebrae. This is this part is the head. This is the neck. And again, this is the articular facet uh, on the tubercle uh, that's going to be articulating with uh, the vertebrae, uh, the facet that's found on the thoracic vertebrae. So this is it for chap for part B for chapter seven. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, you can send me a message through YouTube. Or again, you can leave it in the comments below. Uh, best way is just to email me. Uh, if you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to ask. If you like it, please give the, this video a thumbs up. Please share and also be sure to subscribe. Uh, when you subscribe, uh, whenever I post a new videos, you guys will get alerts. And you can go ahead and, and view the content. Uh, thank you again for watching.